Good evening. It is the holiday season, specifically on the day that I will be releasing this. It is Christmas Day, which is one of the most important uh, holidays and or well, days in general for Christians around the world, at least Western Christians, Catholics and Protestants. Some of you may not be celebrating Christmas, others may be, but in any case, you can't deny that it is an important day of the year for many people around the world. And I've seen a lot of people on YouTube lately do special Christmas episodes. And of course, I'm also going to deliver, at least in some sense. I uh, won't be able to do a full uh, video in the format that I usually do here, but I'm going to give you at least something for Christmas or the holiday season this year. As most of you probably know, Christmas is the time of year when Christians celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, who is considered by Christians to be the Son in the Holy Trinity and thus the, the incarnation of God's Word in human form. Uh, the person who brought salvation to humankind through his suffering and death on the cross, etc. This It's all very well known, of course. Um, and the birth of this figure is, of course, very important, and it's celebrated around the world in different ways, of course. It is celebrated on today on December 25th in m most of the sort of Western Christian world, whereas in many of the Orthodox churches it's celebrated later in, in January. But the purpose of the day remains the same, to celebrate the supposed birth of Jesus. And this can, of course, mean different things to different people, different interpretations and symbolic understandings of what this birth is supposed to mean and one of what I think the most fascinating and striking ways of looking at Christmas comes from the very famous uh, 14th and 13th century mystic Christian mystic Meister Eckhart. And I made a full video on Meister Eckhart about a year ago actually also I think on December 25th last year and he is one of the most important figures in the history of Christian mysticism. But he is also controversial because he proposed certain ideas about God and the relationship of God to the soul and creation that to some people seemed a little out of line. And certain of his um, claims, certain, of, certain quotes from his works and sermons were later deemed heretical after his death. But today he has sort of regained his reputation as, as a very important person in church history. Now, Eckhart taught very significantly that the ground, he talks about this thing he calls the ground, the Grund in German, which is this sort of innermost essence or um, foundation of God, to begin with, like right, he talks about the grunt, the ground of God. But what is significant is that he also says that the ground of God is the ground of the soul. They are one and the same ground. So he proposes that in the innermost essence of the human soul, she is one and completely unified with God himself, right? And that God is in everything that God is this the only reality. There is nothing outside of God. God is the very being of everything that exists. And there's a whole lot more to Eckhart's uh, theology, of course, and you can watch my full video on that if you're interested. Now, based on that very mystical and beautiful, really fascinating philosophy, he also talks about the birth of the word or the birth of the sun, right, which is what Christmas is all about. And so he interprets Christmas, the celebration of the birth of the Son of God, in regular fashion as he always does. He interprets it very metaphysically, you could say. And he talks about the fact that the Son is being born eternally inside the Godhead, the unity of God. Now, of course, usually when we talk about Christmas, we think of the birth of Jesus, the human being, who is the incarnation of the Word. <laughs> And that is also one aspect of Christmas to Eckhart. But Eckhart sees many different dimensions, you could say, of what Christmas symbolizes. On the one hand, of course, it does symbolize the birth of the human Jesus, 
but it also you know, what he is much more interested in, he barely actually mentions the human Jesus in any of his sermons about this topic. Um, he instead uh, talks a lot more about the more metaphysical and psychological aspects of this event, this birth of the Son in the ground of God, in the unity of God and the Godhead, which is taking place eternally in this eternal present. Now, if you remember what I said earlier, that the ground, the very ground, the grunt of God is one and unified with the ground of the soul, this also means that the birth of the Son, birth of Christ or the Word, is taking place in the soul of the human being also at all times. And this becomes very significant for Eckhart and becomes one of the primary symbols for a kind of heightened mystical awareness and consciousness, the absolute uh, mystical experience of the unity with, with God, you could say, uh, is this experience of this birth of the sun in the soul of oneself that is always taking place, but one can realize that when one completely empties the self of any connection to outside things, when one annihilates any sense of self-understanding, when one abandons all forms of knowing either of outside things or of oneself until the soul is a complete blank slate. One is in a state of complete nothingness, right? One has annihilated oneself uh, so that there is nothing left. One just in this complete abyss of the darkness of the soul. And in that state is when the birth of the sun, the birth of the word can take place within the soul. And this is a very important symbol then for Eckhart for this, uh, this process of, of spiritual, uh, spiritual development or spiritual awakening of realizing one's oneness with God and uniting with God. So as you can tell, this is a very unique um, way of looking at Christmas. It's not the, 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 the interpretation of Christmas that you'll hear from uh, your regular Sunday service, of course, but it's one that I find incredibly fascinating. Um, Eckhart was a writer. He wrote many treatises in Latin uh, about you know, commentaries on biblical books, etc. But he was primarily famous as an incredible preacher. He would preach primarily to, uh, to other monks and friars of the Dominican order, but also sometimes to the lay people as well. And he was known as a really gifted uh, preacher whose sermons, a lot of them at least, survive to this day. And four of those sermons are, were held or were given in uh, Christmas season. So they talk about Christmas. Um, and the way that this way that I've just explained how he interprets Christmas as in this very mystical and metaphysical way. So what I thought I would do for this Christmas season is that I would read you one of those Christmas sermons held by Meister Eckhart, all those well, must be almost 800 years ago. Uh, now remember, this is not me preaching anything to you. Um, if you watch this channel, you know where I stand on things. I'm not here to, uh, this is not a confessional video in that sense. Um, I'm not preaching, I'm not reading you Eckhart's sermon in order that you are supposed to uh, necessarily believe in what he says. It's more from a perspective of uh, appreciation and of uh, studying these fascinating figures of history and the way that they express themselves and their very unique ideas. Eckhart's sermons are fascinating to read, regardless if you're Christian or if you're from any other religious tradition. I think one can appreciate the depth of his philosophical thought and mystical ideas and also just see how incredible of a rhetorician he was and how captivating these sermons must have been for those who attended them. So uh, with that said, this is one of the sermons held at Christmas uh, by Meister Eckhart, possibly on December 25th on Christmas Day uh, many, many years ago. <laughs> 
Where is he who was born king of the Jews? Now observe, as regards to this birth, where it takes place. Where is he who is born? Now I say, as I often said before, that this eternal birth occurs in the soul precisely as it does in eternity, no more and no less, for it is one birth, and this birth occurs in the essence and ground of the soul. Now certain questions arise. First of all, since God is in all things as intelligence and is more truly in them than they are in themselves, and more naturally, and since wherever God is, there he must work, knowing himself and speaking his word, in what special respects then is the soul better fitted for this divine operation than our other rational creatures in which God also is? Pay attention to the explanation. God is in all things as being, as activity, as power. But he is fecund in the soul alone, for though every creature is a vestige of God, the soul is the natural image of God. This image must be adorned and perfected in this birth. No creature but the soul alone is receptive to this act, this birth. Indeed, such perfection as enters the soul, whether it be divine, undivided light, grace, or bliss, must enter the soul through this birth, and in no other way. Just await this birth within you, and you shall experience all good and all comfort, all happiness, all being, and all truth. If you miss it, you will miss all good and blessedness. Whatever comes to you in that will bring you pure being and stability. But whatever you seek or cleave to part from this will perish. Take it how you will and where you will, all will perish. This alone gives being, all else perishes. But in this birth you will share in the divine influx and all its gifts. This cannot be received by creatures in which God's image is not found, for the soul's image appertains especially to this eternal birth, which happens truly and especially in the soul, being begotten of the Father in the soul's ground and innermost recesses, into which no image ever shone or soul power peeped. The second question is, since this work of birth occurs in the essence and ground of the soul, then it happens just as much in a sinner as in a saint, so what grace or good is there in it for me? For the ground of nature is the same in both. In fact, even those in hell retain their nobility of nature eternally. Now note the answer. It is a property of this birth that it always comes with fresh light. It always brings a great light to the soul, for it is the nature of good to diffuse itself wherever it is. In this birth, God streams into the soul in such abundance of light, so flooding the essence and ground of the soul that it runs over and floods into the powers and into the outward man. Thus it befell Paul when on his journey God touched him with his light and spoke to him. A reflection of the light shone outwardly so that his companions saw it surrounding Paul like the blessed in heaven. The superfluity of light in the ground of the soul wells over into the body which is filled with radiance. No sinner can receive this light, nor is he worthy to, being full of sin and wickedness, which is called darkness. Therefore, it says, the darkness shall neither receive nor comprehend the light, John 1.5. That is because the paths by which the light would enter are choked and obstructed with guile and darkness, for light and darkness cannot coexist, or God and creatures. If God shall enter, the creatures must simultaneously go out. A man is fully aware of this light. Directly he turns to God, a light being to gleam and glow within him. Directly he turns to God, a light begins to gleam and glow within him, giving him to understand what to do and what to leave undone, with much true guidance in regard to things of which before he knew or understood nothing. And here, supposedly one of the listeners to Eckhart uh, asks him a question in the middle of the sermon. Where do you know this from and in what way? Eckhart says, just pay attention. Your heart is often moved and turned away from the world. How could that be but by this illumination? It is so charming and delightful that you become wary of all things that are not God or gods. It draws you to God and you become aware of many a prompting to do good, though ignorant of whence it comes. This inward inclination is in no way due to creatures or their bidding, for what creatures direct or effect always comes from without. But by this work, it is only the ground of the soul that is stirred, and the freer you keep yourself, the more light, truth, and discernment you will find. 
Thus no man ever went astray for any other reason than that he first departed from this, and then sought too much to cling to outward things. St. Augustine says there are many who sought light and truth, but only outside where it was not to be found. Finally, they go out so far that they never get back home or find their way in again. Thus they have not found the truth, for truth is within, in the ground, and not without. So he who would see light to discern all truth, let him watch and become aware of this birth within, in the ground. Then all his powers will be illuminated, and the outer man as well. For as soon as God inwardly stirs the ground with truth, its light darts into his powers, and that man knows at times more than anyone could teach him. As the prophet says, quote, I have gained greater understanding than all who ever taught me. You see then, because this light cannot shine or lighten in sinners, that is why this birth cannot possibly occur in them. This birth cannot coexist with the darkness of sin, even though it takes place not in the powers, but in the essence and ground of the soul. The question arises, since God the Father gives birth only in the essence and ground of the soul and not in the powers, what concern is it of theirs? How do they help just by being idle and taking a rest? What is the use since this birth does not take place in the powers? A good question. Listen well to the explanation. Every creature works towards some end. The end is always the first in intention, but the last in execution. Thus too, God in all his works has a most blessed end in view, namely himself, to bring the soul and all her powers into that end, himself. For this, all God's works are wrought, for this the Father bears his Son in the soul, so that all the powers of the soul shall come to this. He lies in wait for all that the soul contains, bidding all to this feast at his court. But the soul is scattered abroad among her powers and dissipated in the action of each, the power of sight in the eye, the power of hearing in the ear, the power of tasting in the tongue. Thus her ability to work inwardly is enfeebled, for a scattered power is imperfect. So, for her inward work to be effective, she must call in all her powers and gather them together from the diversity of things to a single inward activity. St. Augustine says the soul is rather where she loves than where she gives life to the body. For example, there was once a pagan master who was devoted to an art, that of mathematics, to which he had devoted all his powers. He was sitting by the embers making calculations and practicing his art when a man came along who drew a sword and, not knowing that it was the master, said, Quick, tell me your name or I'll kill you. The master was too absorbed to see or hear the foe to catch what he said. He was unable to utter a word, even to say, my name is so-and-so. And so the enemy, having cried out several times and got no answer, cut off his head. And this was to acquire a mere natural science. How much more then should we withdraw from all things in order to concentrate all our powers on perceiving and knowing the one infinite uncreated eternal truth? To this end, then, assemble all your powers, all your senses, your entire mind and memory, direct them into the ground where your treasure lies buried. But if this is to happen, realize that you must drop all other works. You must come to an unknowing if you would find it. The question arises, would it not be more valuable for each power to keep to its own task, none hindering the other in their work, nor God in his? Might there not be in me a manner of creaturely knowing that is not a hindrance, just as God knows all things without hindrance, and so too the blessed in heaven? That is a good question. Note the explanation. The blessed see God in a single image, and in that image they discern all things. God too sees himself thus, perceiving all things in himself. He need not turn from one thing to another as we do. Suppose in this life we always had a mirror before us in which we saw all things at a glance and recognized them in a single image. Then neither action nor knowledge would be any hindrance to us, but we have to turn from one thing to another, and so we can only attend to one thing at the expense of another. For the soul is so firmly attached to the powers that she has to flow with them wherever they flow, because in every task they perform, the soul must be present and attentive, or they cannot work at all. If she is dissipated by attending to outward acts, this is bound to weaken her inward work. For at his birth, God needs and must have a vacant, free, and unencumbered soul, containing nothing but himself alone, and which looks to nothing and nobody but him.
As to this, Christ says, Whoever loves anything but me, whoever loves father and mother or many other things, is not worthy of me. I did not come upon the earth to bring peace, but a sword, to cut away all things, to part you from your sister, brother, mother, child, and friend, that in truth are your foes. End quote. For whatever is familiar to you is your foe. If your eye wanted to see all things, and your ear to hear all things, and your heart to remember all things, then indeed your soul would be dissipated in all these things. Accordingly, a master says, to receive an interior act, a man must collect all his powers as if into a corner of his soul, where, hiding away from all images and forms, he can get to work." End quote. Here he must come to a forgetting and an unknowing. There must be a stillness and silence for this word to make itself heard. We cannot serve this word better than in stillness and in silence. There we can hear it, and there too we will understand it aright, in the unknowing. To him who knows nothing, it appears and reveals itself. Another question arises. You might say, sir, you place all our salvation in ignorance. That sounds like a lack. God made man to know, as the prophet says, Lord, make them know. Where there is ignorance, there is a lack. Something is missing. A man is brutish, an ape, a fool, and remains so long as he is ignorant. Ah, but here we must come to a transformed knowledge, and this unknowing must not come from ignorance, but rather from knowing we must get to this unknowing. Then we shall become knowing with divine knowing, and our unknowing will be ennobled and adorned with supernatural knowing. And through holding ourselves passive in this, we are more perfect than if we were active. That is why one master declares that the sense of hearing is nobler than that of sight, for we learn more wisdom by hearing than by seeing, and in it live the more wisely. We hear of a pagan master who lay dying, his disciples discussed in his presence some noble art, and dying though he was, he lifted up his head to listen, saying, Oh, let me hear this art now that I may rejoice in it forever. Hearing draws in more, but seeing rather leads outward. The very act of seeing does this. Therefore, in eternal life we shall rejoice far more in our power of hearing than in that of sight. For the act of hearing the eternal word is within me, but the act of seeing goes forth from me. In hearing I am passive, but in seeing I am active. But our bliss lies not in our activity, but in being passive to God. For just as God is more excellent than creatures, by so much is God's work more excellent than mine. It was from his immeasurable love that God set our happiness in suffering, for we undergo more than we act and receive incomparably more than we give, and each gift that we receive prepares us to receive yet another gift, indeed a greater one, and every gift further increases our receptivity and the desire to receive something yet higher and greater. Therefore some teachers say that it is in this respect the soul is commensurate with God. For just as God is boundless in giving, so too the soul is boundless in receiving or conceiving. And just as God is omnipotent to act, so too the soul is no less profound to suffer, and thus she is transformed with God and in God. God must act and the soul must suffer. He must know and love himself in her. She must know with his knowledge and love with his love. And thus she is far more with what is his than with her own. And so too her bliss is more dependent on his action than her own. The pupils of St. Dionysius asked him why Timothy surpassed them all in perfection. Dionysius said, Timothy is a God-suffering man. Whoever is expert at this could outstrip all men. In this way, your unknowing is not a lack, but your chief perfection, and your suffering is your highest activity. And so in this way, you must cast aside all your deeds and silence your faculties if you really wish to experience this birth in you. If you would find the newborn king, you must outstrip and abandon all else that you might find, that we may outstrip and cast behind us all things unpleasing to the newborn king. May he help us who became a human child, in order that we might become the children of God. Amen. So that was the sermon by Meister Eckhart. I hope you found it as fascinating as I do. It really, like I said in the beginning, he, re he barely mentions the human Jesus. 
uh, in this at all. It's just, he goes completely and directly into the deep metaphysical thought about this, the ground of God and the soul and how the sun is born inside the ground of the soul and all this. Uh, and, and he really expresses a lot of those fundamental and central aspects of his philosophical and mystical thought in this sermon in ways that I just think is so clever and very fascinating. Uh, so, as I said, also, I think, regardless of your religious affiliation, I think we can appreciate from a historical perspective uh, the, the skill of Meister Eckhart and his sermons. Uh, the sermons were held in German, in a vernacular language, was, which was also quite a unique at that point. Many of the great church figures expressed themselves exclusively in Latin. But Eckhart would uh, write and preach a lot in Middle High German, which is what makes him really fascinating. Anyway, I hope that was an interesting and uh, thought-provoking little Christmas episode. So to wrap up, in whatever way you celebrate the holiday season, if you celebrate Christmas, if you celebrate the solstice that took place uh, a few days ago, if you celebrated Hanukkah recently, Whatever, I hope you have a wonderful holiday season and a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. I hope to see you in a, the next video very soon. I'll see you then.